I'm Ayelet Waldman. I'm Paul Waldman. This is Boundary Issues. Welcome to Boundary Issues, the podcast where two siblings solve all the world's problems while blaming each other for their own. That is our new tagline. We're still workshopping it. If you want to get in touch and tell us what you think of it, you can email us at waldmanpodcast at gmail.com. And if you want to support the show, we have a Patreon. So you can go to patreon.com slash boundary issues. All right, today we are going to be talking about not only the current situation in Israel and Gaza, but also some of the the events that have led up to this and the Israeli army and really the Israeli soul. So maybe I can start, I yell it, by asking you how you are feeling at the moment, uh, a couple of months after October 7th, as we're all still grappling with what's going on there. How am I doing? Well, uh, my social media feed, I'm not on social media that much anymore, but is this insane combination of quilting and horrible, tragic images from Gaza with weirdly the occasional like lunatic right wing Zionist comment. I don't know how that happens, but you know, the algorithm is the algorithm. You know, what I found is I kind, which is appropriate to today, I kind of latch on to the people I think are really the honest, only honest brokers in this situation, and that's um, leftist organizations in Israel and Palestine. I mean, they they seem to be the only ones able to hold in their mind the concept that you can be horrified by this unbearable thing that's going on in Gaza, this this truly, it's difficult to wrap your mind around the extent of the devastation being rained from the skies, and at the same time, condemn the awful action by Hamas on October 7th. That seems really hard for people to do. So um, when I am feeling my moral compass start to, you know, spin out from true north, I usually go to see what they're saying over at Breaking the Silence or Standing Together. What about you? How are you doing? I'm feeling something very similar. You know, it's my job to have opinions and to try to persuade people that I'm right about things. And I, you know, I've been similarly frustrated with how just tribal the response to all the events there have been from so many people, even people whom I respect and care about. Here's a way to think about it. There's a poll question that's been asked for years and years. I think Gallup asks this, other pollsters do, that says, which side do you sympathize with more, Israel or the Palestinians? As though this is some kind of zero-sum contest and you have to pick one. And then we can see, you know, how many people are picking this one, how many Democrats are picking the Israelis, how many Republicans are picking the Palestinians. And it's so frustrating. And that's what that's what I find gets me really, really frustrated and makes it difficult for me to write about this. I mean, I've always been honestly somewhat reluctant to write about Israel too much because, you know, you just get a wave of invective no matter what you say. But the fact that, you know, there are so many people who can't seem to get it into their heads that it is a horror and a tragedy when a family is murdered in their home on the east side of the line separating Gaza and Israel. And it's also a horror and a tragedy when a family is killed in their homes by a bomb on the west side of that border. I just see so many people working to kind of dismiss the humanity of the other side to basically say like, this is okay. It's okay that October 7th happened or on the other side, it's okay that as of now, at least 26, 27,000 people have been killed in Gaza, that that's okay. And we don't have to reckon with the moral problem of that because of some way that we can somehow dehumanize those people and say that their lives don't have value and we don't have to be uh, concerned about what it does to us. And I think, and that's something that we're going to be talking about today, I think is what it does to you when you dehumanize other people. 
that's a perfect introduction into Avnerik Varyahu, who is a friend and also, more importantly, the executive director of Breaking the Silence. So Breaking the Silence is an organization of former soldiers, some of them current soldiers who are, you know, in the way that Israelis are, you know, serve in the reserves until they're about 40. Um, this is an organization of veteran soldiers who served in the West Bank, who were at war in Gaza. And what they do is they provide testimonies to things they themselves saw and did in the West Bank, wherever they happen to be. And it's incredibly compelling testimony. It's horrific testimony. And it really is this kind of mirror onto both uh, Israeli society and also society of the IDF. Now, Avner himself, he's the executive director, as I said, um, Avner was born into a religious Zionist family. And I, one of the things we're going to ask you about, Avner, is your kind of journey from your background, your family to where you are today. So why don't you tell us a little bit more about Breaking the Silence and then maybe talk about how you ended up joining this group of incredibly brave people. Yeah, thank you so much, you know, for having me and for letting me sort of eavesdrop on your uh, brother-sister conversation. I'd be happy to talk a bit about Breaking the Silence and, and, and also you know, say how, you know, October 7th sort of affected us personally. And I think that there was, um, there still are some, you know, sort of um, thought processes where we're, we're going through organizationally as we, we lost members of, of our activist community on October 7th. But uh, before that, you know, we've been around for 20 years this year. Um, we're a group of former Israeli soldiers. We all served ourselves in the occupied territories. When we talk about the occupied territories, we refer to the West Bank and Gaza, of course. Uh, this is contentious in the Israeli society as you know, the talking point is that we left the Gaza Strip. For us, it's really important to talk about both the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. And we're basically a platform for men and women who carried out different parts of a military occupation. It's not only the combat soldiers, even though most of our testifiers are. I myself was also a combat soldier. I served as a paratrooper in the special ops unit. But a occupation that has been going on for such a long time, like the one we're conducting, isn't only about soldiers standing in a checkpoint. It's uh, about the legal system. It's a bureaucracy, it's technology, it's intelligence. So we really try to sort of um, talk to anyone that had a part and is taking a part in this, um, in this uh, system of oppression. Uh, and we don't do this only to be sort of an archive and definitely not to cleanse our soul, but you know, we do it in order to take responsibility and we connect the, the work of our testimonies, our opportunity to share our stories together with our educational work or political work or our advocacy work. You know, we're, our goal is to end occupation. And fundamentally, we believe that, you know, there's a cliche in Hebrew, a kibush mashchit, occupation corrupts. I think that the reality that we're living through, and especially the current government leading us through this catastrophe, I think is probably one of the best examples that the occupation has corrupted the soul of, of our society. But I'm saying that together with the fact that we're day-to-day -day fighting for that exact soul. So uh, every soldier that comes to us and we meet between 70 to 120 soldiers every year, probably this year, many, many more because of what's going on in Gaza, is maybe pessimistic because he's talking about horrific things, but it's optimistic because it's another person that was a tool of oppression that understands that he now can use his stories in order to try to create change. And, and, and for me, that's what kept me for such a long time, you know, doing this work. And what about you, Avner? How did you get there? What, what was it that, where did you come from? emotionally, familiarly, and how did you get to the point where you took the step of going to breaking the silence? 
So, I mean, I have to blame my parents, right? We always blame our parents. I'm sure you'll have a chance to blame Oh, we do all the time. Well. <laughs> Paul won't even let me do it because he says it's inappropriate on a podcast. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I'm saying like blame with, with, with every uh, inch of, of love because my dad's a eighth generation Jerusalemites who are very, you know, from a family that for years has been rooted in, in this land and specifically in Jerusalem. I mean, my mom uh, grew up in upstate New York to a sort of conservadox family, sort of conservative turning maybe orthodox family. And our household was always a household that encouraged argument and conversation and big questions both my mom and dad are very involved within our community and they were sort of models for us to, to challenge authority around us. And, and um, I went to a yeshiva in, in uh, Rishon Lezion. We grew up in Rehovot, but um, so, you know, um, a yeshiva where half of the day you learn religious studies and the second half of the day, you learn, you know, math and biology and physics. And and I, one one day, I think this was ninth grade or 10th grade, my our teacher, our rabbi, started the day by teaching some religious texts, which were Mishnah, right? You start the day learning Mishnah, and then you go to the hard stuff, which is Gemara. And he started the day by saying, today we're going to learn a Mishnah in the memory of Rabbi Meir Kahana. Oh my God! So, uh, Avner, tell tell people who Mayor Kahana was. So, at, as like a ninth grader, I sort of knew who Mayor Kahana was, but Mayor Kahana was uh, you know, an American uh, Jew who started, I, I would call it a fascist organization in the U.S. called uh, the Jewish Defense League, the JDL, which was. Um, you know, racist, I would say fascist, uh, Islamophobic. Absolutely. Um, All those things he, are true. And he, and, and he uh, fled, he fled the U.S. because the JDL was involved in basically semi-terrorist activity on U.S. soil and started a party, a political party in Israel called Kach, Kahana to Parliament, named sort of his party, which became sort of this infamous party that ran, uh, lost initially, then won one seat, and, and then and then eventually Kahana himself was banned from running for parliament. But for years, Kahana was seen as sort of the most extreme figure to ever walk the corridors of the Knesset. And the story was whenever he would speak in parliament, 119 members of Knesset or parliament would leave so that, you know, even the, even the Likud, even at Tanyao's party, he wasn't in that party back in the day, but even the Likud back in the day sort of spoke out against Kahana. So this figure is definitely not someone you want to learn a Mishnah in the memory of, uh, at least, you know, on the face of it. But growing up in the religious nationalist community, the, that specific rabbi uh, thought it was appropriate. And and I'm telling the story because I knew from my parents that Kahana wasn't a guy that you read a Mishnah in the memory of. And I and I started and I basically told my rabbi, I don't I don't think this is appropriate. And we started arguing and I eventually, you know, went to my dad and told my dad and he gave me a book uh, that he had about Kahana. And I gave it to my rabbi and my rabbi read it and he actually said, Thank you for lending me the book. And, and we had sort of this interesting conversation. But I, I'm saying this to say, one, it, it made sense, I think, for my rabbi to teach us a Mishnah. So that's sort of, I think, I wouldn't say mainstream religious nationalism, but definitely elements within the religious nationalist community, the community I grew up in. But my parents educated us to challenge what was happening around us. And I think that for me, that was, that was a real real gift, right? So that's why I say I blame my parents because when I, when I started my military service back in 2004, I started with a lot of belief and enthusiasm and, and, and thinking I could be sort of the right guy in the bad situation. And, 
and thinking, you know, this is my responsibility as an Israeli, but also very cognizant of of sort of what I have to be aware of. And, and I think that that awareness initially, I sort of tried to hold between, you know, hold this tension between being aware, but being a good soldier. And I think what happened to me, the process that brought me to breaking the silence is basically that that tension broke. And, and I realized that being a good soldier means oppressing another people. And, and specifically as a later on, but during my service as well, you know, uh, as a sergeant of a sniper's team and as a paratrooper, uh, we would we would do night raids, uh, specifically one mission that really came to define a lot of my service, uh, a mission called Straw Widows, where you basically barge into a house and use it as an observation point, um, really sort of shook me to my core because we were barging into innocent people's homes in the middle of the night, uh, waking up entire families, handcuffing, blindfolding, you know, the head of the family, children peeing in their pants out of fear, the you know, the anger of the teenagers, it was always like the teenagers eyes looking at us like angry. And I think just a just a core feeling of, you know, we're not leaving behind us a lot of love for Israel, right? We're not not a lot of big Ohave Israel. And and I think that it was just like um it it wasn't even like a political thought. It was just like a very I, I felt sick. I felt sick. Like and now it's not that I, I couldn't find rationale in the missions, right? And it's not that every time we entered the refugee camps of Nablus or Janine, we were, you know, we were welcomed with uh, flowers and rice, right? Uh, friends of mine were injured. I was shot at personally. A soldier of mine was shot a few meters from me. It could have been me, I you know. But, but, but I think that the general sense or the general sort of uh, feeling I had was I thought that this is that I'm doing this to protect my country and my people and my family but I felt I was doing the opposite and I, I think adding to that I think the first level was feeling that I'm I'm not protecting my family or or you know my, my country but I think adding to that was that I'm that I'm not only not protecting my own people I'm also part of a tool of oppression for millions of others. And, and I think that was really sort of this awakening moment. I, this one house I entered in Nablus, which was towards the end of my service and was really sort of the straw that sort of broke the camel's back for me, was a house of a, uh, of a doctor in Nablus and basically this very you know, learned guy with excellent English where we barged into his house in the middle of the night. And he, he just schooled me. Like he was so eloquent and, and smart. And he basically sort of explained to me in, in, in a very smart way what it's like to live as a Palestinian. And I think he he really managed to to, you know, wake me up to the thought that maybe the individual soldier could control the specific situation. He sort of, sort of took those blindfolds off for me. And, and there's so many homes that I entered as a soldier, so many Palestinians that I saw in checkpoints. I don't remember faces so much, like it's a bit of a blur, but this house in Nablus, this doctor in Nablus, like I'll never forget. And, and I think that uh, that was sort of a, a, a very powerful night after that, I think I, I tried not to, I tried to do whatever I could not to go into mission still as a soldier, like finding excuses and so on. And the moment I finished my service, I looked for a way to do something, talk about it, think. And, and for me, breaking the silence was sort of a, a perfect fit. That brings us to this, to a question, you know, I've been, that I think is, is I've been seeing so many testimonies of on breaking the silence at on your website, through your social media, of soldiers who served in Gaza, who are talking about now, you know, trying to wake up Israeli society and the world to what happened then and how and what's happening now. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit, if you could help us understand what's going on on the ground, what those soldiers are doing, what the, the soldiers who are trying to wake up, you know, people who had been there before, 
who are um, talking about, again, the breaking the silence is always a testimony about what you yourself did. Can you give us a little insight into what might be going on on the ground now and how that, and a little bit about what you, what the members of breaking the silence have been talking about from the previous war? Yeah. So, so I will say that we, we try to be very cautious uh, and this is always historically, like, you know, we're seen as like, you know, you know, some would say the most radical or others, you know, more like edgy or, but we're actually a pretty, we try to be very, very safe in what we say because we base our information on testimonies and we think that this round is different than other rounds. And and it's different than other rounds also because of the events of October 7th that not only, you know, were horrific and, and I think haven't ended, you know, there's over 130 hostages, there's people that are still in mourning, there's, you know, probably people that are dead and we don't know, you know, so it's still on, it's still ongoing. And, and, and that is, isn't only important psychologically, but it's important because it affects the way the operation is going on, right? There's, on the ground, right? there's Israelis in the strip. That was, we never had that before. I mean, yes, Gilad Shalit, yes, uh, Avera Mangisto, there were, you know, sporadic Israelis, but not this number during an operation so wide. Uh, so I think that's that's one significant difference. And the second is, it's scary or, or weird to even say this, but it seems that any breaks that Israel had in previous operations, not only are not gone, it's sort of, it's all on steroids. That makes us sort of very cautious in saying what was is exactly what is happening now. We definitely can say that Israel didn't rewrite its military doctrines on October 8th. A military doctrine, sort of the political framework, if you'd like, or like the philosophy behind the, the, the fighting was written in the different operations around Gaza in 2008, 2009, and in 2014. Those we think haven't changed. And therefore, I think it is, I think that the testimonies we do have and our understanding on the strip is significant, even though it might be only partial information. So giving that very long introduction, I think that part of what we understand is that um, one of the main doctrines that the army works under is what is called the Dachia Doctrine, with the Dachia neighborhood in Beirut, where uh, many leaders of the Hezbollah um, live or lived basically a neighborhood that Israel almost destroyed in the Second Lebanese War. This became sort of known as the Dachia Doctrine, where the, the concept behind the Dachia Doctrine is to show the enemy that that the landlord has gone crazy. And to show the landlord has gone crazy, right? We're the landlord and we're showing our enemies that we've gone crazy, is it's basically using immense power in a disproportionate way, uh, which is contradictory in many elements to international law, and targeting of infrastructure that could be um, used both for military but also civilian infrastructure. And understanding that doctrine, I think, explains a lot of what we've seen unfold in the Strip. Um, so there's many, many examples of this, but one thing that we know from previous operations, and we know this from our testifiers, you know, Israel is talking about being very precise, doing everything in their power. Netanyahu said doing everything in their, in their power to protect civilians. If you listen to the soldiers who served in the Strip and you listen to not only infantry, but air force, right, or artillery, that's where the real casualties are. Our, our testifiers talked about the fact that the um, um, accuracy that we, that, that many will give, definitely the Israeli official spokesman, the accuracy that we will give our Air Force is, is much more dubious than, than we think of it. The targets that we use or that we shoot at are many times um, not accurate or not only military targets. I'll give you just one 
concrete example, which is something that we understood from our testifiers, there has been a widespread tactic in previous operations of targeting houses or apartments of Hamas members or Islamic Jihad members, right? So if there's an apartment building in Gaza, in this apartment building, there might be one apartment that is owned by a Hamas member. We have turned not only that specific apartment into a target, but the entire building into a target, right? So if you saw in in previous operations, entire buildings collapse, that could be the rationale. In previous operations, we would shoot small missiles to warn the people in the house, right? And what we call knock on the roof. And then people would leave the house and then the house would be destroyed. Still, sometimes people were killed. We know that in this operation, the army said that they're hardly using knock on roof. Now, they said they don't have the capacity I would argue it has to do with the Dachia doctrine. But regardless of why, people are not getting a warning shot. So you can have entire buildings with people sometimes inside them uh, be destroyed because one person inside the building is a Hamas member. So I see what seems like an obvious connection between some of the tactics that Israel is using right now in Gaza, and as you say, things they've done in Lebanon, and also the kind of experiences people have in the West Bank, which is despite on the one hand, as you said, the government officials, especially Prime Minister Netanyahu, are insisting to the world that we are being proportionate in our response, we're being careful, we're doing everything we can to limit civilian casualties. But on the ground, it seems as though convincing Palestinians to be as frightened and demoralized as possible seems to be kind of built in to the doctrine of how you treat people. And I'm wondering if you if if you feel that that's true, especially including in your experiences in the West Bank. You know, you talked about going into families' homes and seeing those terrified families. I think for a lot of Americans, that will sound somewhat familiar with what they saw American troops doing in Iraq. And I think most Americans now perhaps understand that whatever they thought about the cause, that that was inevitably going to bring about uh, an extraordinary amount of resistance from the Iraqi, Iraqi civilians. So I wonder, is that kind of part of the point to tell people that the, the, the force that they are facing is overwhelming, they cannot fight back, and this is just how, they're gonna, how things are going to have to be? In order to, in the case of the West Bank, maintain this kind of apartheid system, in the case of Gaza now, I'm not even sure what. You know, we talk about the this goal to eradicate Hamas, which nobody really thinks is possible. But what is it that what is the message that the government and the army's tactics right now are meant to send to Palestinians who are in Gaza? And maybe building on that. Is the mass destruction that we see the sort of what I think someone was saying that I've heard reports of 85% of the homes uninhabitable, destroyed. Is that the point? Is, as Paul says, demoralizing? Are we, is Israel showing now the landlord has lost his mind? And I'm using that pronoun on purpose. I think that part of the way Israel the army, and many elements within Israeli society see the mission at this point is what some people will call uh, deterrence. There was a horrific attack on Israeli communities, murder, kidnapping, rape of uh, Israeli citizens, civilians, soldiers as well, but civilians... Um, from from within, you know, their homes in the kibbutz, from from a party, and in order to allow Israelis to feel safe, then we have to create a massive deterrence. I think part of the question is, and, and this I don't have an answer to. I think some Israelis are saying this explicitly, but is when we say deterrence, do we actually mean revenge? And I think that I think for some 
Israelis, and I think for definitely for some soldiers, definitely for some ministers, um, maybe for some generals. Yes, part of what we're doing is revenge. I think that be, beyond that, and there definitely is an element of revenge, I think beyond that, there is also a concept that every basketball player will tell you the best defense is offense, right? And I think in that sense, Israel, because of the lack of will or want of the majority of the Israeli society, and because of the lack of the will and the want of the international community, has very limited time and ability to carry out its operations in the West Bank and definitely in Gaza, right? There's always a question of when the Americans, right? Your side of the pond will tell us to stop. The the tools we're using to destroy the homes in Gaza um, are sent from your country, right? I mean, of course, weapons, but definitely the bombs, air force, artillery. So there's a clear understanding that, that we need the U.S., and we definitely need the international community. So there is de- developed, I think, mostly around Gaza, but this is also true to the West Bank. But Gaza, I think, is, 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 is most clearly this concept. What many have talked about, many generals have talked about, of the concept of mowing the lawn. And this sounds horrible, but this is the language used. We'll go into Gaza every couple of years and you have to mow the lawn. Now, I don't know if we can talk about this operation or this war as another one of these operations. It could be that we're going to stay in the Strip indefinitely. Just yesterday, there were 12 ministers, 12 ministers from this government, I think 17 members of parliament, not only from the religious nationalist party, some from the Likud, that were in a convention promoting and supporting resettling in the Gaza Strip. Now, I don't know if this is going to be the plan. There is pushback, but but I do think that we were facing something that is new, that will allow powers to be unleashed. But But I do think, to your question, There is a constant sense, and this is true definitely in our northern border and in our southern border, sorry, the Gaza border, not southern border, and in the West Bank, is that we're constantly in this process of deterrence. And this is why we have to use our our force. I think people like me will argue that if you look at other borders of ours, like the Egyptian border or like the Jordanian border, right, they're strong and safe borders because we have peace agreements, right? And and I think that part of the crossroads that we're in, and I think that this very much depends on the outcome of both Netanyahu and Biden, like how long both will stay in office and who will who will take their seats, if at all, right? To see if we're in a crossroads that push, puts Israel in a real place where they're going to have to choose this continued deterrence, indefinite deterrence, constantly mowing the lawn, which is, you know, just means more death and more destruction and more Palestinians buried under rubble and and yes more israelis killed and more israeli soldiers killed which for me is 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 extremely sad to think about that um or will there be a different path that will that we will choose but i think that um i'm i'm not optimistic in that sense well can i ask you about that about how people are feeling within israel right now because you know, october 7th is obviously an event that is going to resonate in the Israeli psyche for decades, maybe centuries, who knows? And you can react to it in a few different ways as a society. You can say, this shows how barbaric our enemies are, and we have to keep doing what we've been doing except more. Or you can say, this shows that something is not working and has to change. I'm wondering, amongst Israelis now, what kind of discussions are people having about that as they look to the future? Do people think like, we just need to crack down, we need to continue this? 
and then we'll think about that later. Are more people saying something has to change? What What are those conversations like right now? You know, it's interesting that it's people are talking about these conversations as the conversations about the the day after, right? The day after the war. What do we do the day after the war? And it's just sort of a an, an anecdote, but very telling. Netanyahu has delayed twice in the sort of war cabinet, the you know specific cabinet that was built for the war, together with Benny Gantz and Gadi Eisenkot. He delayed twice a conversation that was supposed to take place about the day after. So it's like literally Netanyahu does not want to talk about the day after. So I think that Netanyahu isn't only playing a political game. He is. But but I think that there's also a very strong sense within the Israeli society that we're not ready to have that conversation. I think I think we have to, right? And I think that, you know, some of us in our human rights, anti-occupation community, peace camp have been pushing these these conversations and putting together conferences and trying to sort of push the fact that we should be thinking about, you know, what what we're doing without allowing settlements to grow in Gaza. The idealistic right is also pushing for the day after. They're talking about settlements and, and so on. But I think that there is, if you're talking about the, I think, sort of the understanding, sort of the heartbeat of Israeli society, I think that there's a there's a strong feeling that that I think people generally are still in mourning, I think on a deep level. So yeah, you know, I'm a political activist and and, and I'm also still in mourning, but I, but I think that many of us are sort of forcing ourselves to have these conversations. And I, and, and I think this is also true to my political opponents on the right. I think they're also in mourning and their reaction is to sort of, you know, bring up sort of their dreams of resettling Gaza. But I think that, that many Israelis on a very deep level are, are in mourning either for a loved one. It's, you know, we're such a small society. Everyone knows multiple people who were killed or injured uh, or people that were killed on October 7th. And if not on October 7th, they know a soldier that was killed or injured. I mean, this is, it's very hard to, you know, you really have to be extremely lucky for you not to know someone who's extremely close that was that was killed, a friend, a family member, but I think that we're that is that Israelis are also in mourning for their deep, deep belief in the army. Um, I think that for maybe this is only second to the Yom Kippur War, right? This this deep sense of of insecurity. We know that we have a a shitty government, and and we know that you know maybe our post office doesn't work. Avner saying that because I sent him a gift and it never arrived. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but we but we do sort of have this trust in 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 our security establishment. Now I would argue that it's a false trust, but still most Israelis, you know, they know someone who served. They themselves are. It's it's there's a real sense of trust within the system, and I think that that not only did so many Israelis lose someone that they know personally, but also this veneer or this this feeling that there's some sort of reasonable or responsible adult that will allow us to have a basic sense of security, right? Like a Base, the basic thing a, a country needs to give its citizen, right? Like Hobbes 101, right? Like you need to have the basic feeling of security. That was shattered. And, and I think those two things together basically create a deep sense of, of mourning. And, and I think you know, any one of us who was sat shiva, right? Or it's in mourning to a family member or a close friend, you, you go into yourself, you, you sort of go into like a shell. And, and I think that that has happened on a society level and that doesn't allow many of us and many Israelis to, to be open to that conversation. I, I will share, you know, we're talking, you, you know, it's sort of uh, as, as, as siblings. My brother today came back from almost three months of serving in Gaza. 
And it's, I think, the first time in, in months that I can breathe. It's the first time I know my parents are going to sleep well. Um, my brother-in-law as well, you know, hasn't been home for, for months. My, uh, my sister's uh, husband as well. I have another brother-in-law who's, who's, who's up north. So I think that, that these conversations should be happening. It's already late. We're late in the game because this conversation is so underdeveloped in Israel on like, what do we want to do with like the biggest, you know, the elephant in the room we've been ignoring for years. But now you have another level of, it's not denial. I think it's, it's, it's real sort of trauma and grief. And, and I hope that what would grow out of this um, grief is political bravery, is a sense that we, we have to stop ignoring this reality. And mostly, I think our biggest, you know, Nayelit knows this, that I think that for, for so many of, of, of us, I think our, one of our biggest challenges throughout the years was the apathy of Israeli society to basically Palestinians, right? But, but to the conflict... I'll interject. Let me just tell a quick story about that apathy because I think it's really telling. Breaking the silence will take you to see the truth of what's happening in the West Bank. Reach out if you want to go. I've gone a number of times and on one of these trips that we made, I brought a bunch of Israeli journalists. We, Breaking the Silence organized and on this thing that we were doing and we brought these Israeli journalists and a dear friend of mine was one of the journalists. And through the course of the day, over and over again, she said, she said, Lo yuman. it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. And by the end of the day, I was so angry. I said, what? It's unbelievable. You live an hour away. You live an hour away from here. How is this something you don't know about? And I think it is that apathy, but it's also this purposeful ignorance. I mean, it's the same as what's going on in Gaza, right? It's this this sense of we're just not going to think about what it's like when buildings collapse on entire families and children are having their limbs amputated without anesthetic and thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people are dying and their homes will never be inhabitable for the foreseeable future. And it makes all the sense in the world that it's a trauma response now, you know, this kind of vengeance, this feeling of just deep torture I feel it to a certain extent, even so far away. I think we told you that our father was one of the founders of Kibbutz Kisufim. We feel like we have this immediate connection. But that refusal to understand what's happening is the same refusal, don't you think? I think that it sits on similar places. And in the end, I think where, you know, there was a, a feeling like in the first months that, you know, this, this togetherness, you know, three months ago we had a baby. 26 of October, right? Uh, Adam was born and my wife gave birth in, in Tel Aviv and Ichilov. So this is the beginning of the war. And, you know, of course there were sirens going off when, you know, just before Adam came into the world, but that, I was sitting there with, with Noah waiting for Adam to come and, you know, on every screen it's, it's together we will win, right? Beyachad in even the ads, I was watching Israeli TV and it's like the ads for the banks, the ad, everything, you know? Yeah, for toilet paper. On toilet paper, it's the, we will win together on toilet paper. And, and I think that part of the, the there's a strong feeling of, of, of like this togetherness, which, which I find scary because obviously I'm, I'm thinking about my Palestinian friends who were who are not part of this together. I'm thinking about my Palestinian friends living in Hebron or my Palestinian friends living in, in uh, you know, or Israeli citizens or Palestinian citizens of Israel who are attacked or delegitimized or real sort of um, McCarthyist um, moment for our fellow citizens. Uh, but, but obviously, I know people in Gaza. I know people in Gaza. You know, they're, they're, they're people that, you know, Directors of organizations, people that we're in touch with, that together that togetherness is 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 scary. I think that part of what is happening now is we're we're going back in many aspects to where we were prior to October seventh. Many people are again ignoring. 
and going back to this sort of um, we're not willing to ask himself these these big questions but but I do feel that there this this moment was such a, a rattle that it might force something new uh, I don't know what I don't know what some of it could be bad but but I think I I think you know if I if, if I will risk a prediction I think we're gonna see elections this year I think Netanyahu is gonna lose and I think this is very much connected to yes a hostage deal or no if there's a hostage deal which I hope there will be I hope it will be together with a ceasefire inshallah um, I think this will means the end of Netanyahu uh, strengthen of Ben Gvir, but I do think there's a chance for there to be a centrist government, center, maybe center left. That that forces this conversation that we've been ignoring. Because if the Americans and the Saudis and the Emiratis and the Europeans are saying, we need a longer lasting solution for Gaza than mowing the lawn. And you, Israel, need us because you don't want this humanitarian catastrophe on your border. Then this is a moment that might create leverage to say we are forced as a society to revisit this thing that we've basically tucked far away in our consciousness for 20 years doesn't mean that we're going to vote for peace. It means we're going to vote for something that's not mowing the lawn. Do you think there's a chance at all that it, that the international community can pressure the Israeli government sufficiently to make the two-state solution a viable solution? What I remember once, I think it was you, it might have been you or Yehuda, another um, one of the leaders of Breaking Silence, somebody asked that question about a Palestinian state, uh, what you guys said was the West Bank is, you can't carve out. It is, it is a piece of Swiss cheese. There's so many Israeli settlements. The policy of the government has made it so that a Palestinian state is untenable. That's what they did on purpose. That's the, has been all the goal. Settlements never stopped, even when they were supposed to stop. So do you think there is a prayer that with sufficient international pressure, there could be some kind of two-state solution. I guess I'm asking you, hope or hopelessness? Where are you? So, so you know our friend Yehuda, he, he, considers himself a, he considers himself a two-state extremist, right? Yehuda, <laughs> uh, I, I wouldn't necessarily put me in that camp, but not, not far from it. I mean, I, I think that I'm open to other ideas, but, but I think it's actually interesting that ideas of confederation or open borders or so on, which are definitely worth worth thinking about, I think are that seem farther away for many Israelis now, right? I mean, there there is going back the, the sense of going back to borders. You know, a few years ago, I I met Congresswoman Ilhan Omar, and we we talked about you know politics and so on, and, and it was interesting. You know, she she said that she supports the two-state solution, which, you know, I found interesting. I don't know where she stands now, but I would imagine still, and she says, and I'm saying this because I understand the importance of borders, you know, from where she came from. And so I think, I think that, I think that was, that was, that was sort of an interesting take, but I think the question is, and it has always been about political will, and I think that that what we've seen, and this is where, you know, the Swiss cheese analogy or the control or the siege on Gaza is such a strong element within the way we see our security, right? Our security means their control. That's sort of the equation. And uh, the security of Israelis means control of Palestinians, a dangerous and false equation. But, but that's, I think, the equation we're working under. I believe, and this is where I'm hopeful, I, I believe that if this equation will change and if there will be enough energy put in, I don't know if, if, if we're talking about the two state that looks like Oslo, I don't know exactly what it means, but I do think that the concept of Palestinian independence is, is crucial. And I, and I think that, yes, there are, there are, there's still a way 
for Palestinian independence, which which is I think obviously Israel is a state, so you know Palestinian independence means a two two state solution. But the goal is Palestinian independence. And I think that's possible if there's political will. I think today there's zero political will in Jerusalem. Definitely not with this government. If there'll be a new government, if there'll be big carrots put on the table by the international community, if the Palestinian Authority gets its act together, and I think there's a lot that has to be done in that arena as well, I think that there might be a way to revive something. I don't know exactly what, but even that a real revival, not only for the sake of the process, but a real revival with um, with benchmarks and significant steps that are difficult for Israel to, to backtrack, I think are significant. And I think and I think are also possible. So that would require an awakening to the idea that Netanyahu promised you forget the moral argument. The, we have been making the moral argument about the about what occupation means and how vicious and immoral it is. Forget the moral argument for the majority. Netanyahu promised you security. That's why you could make a garden next to the wall in Gaza. And what we have proven, as you were talking about the IDF and the failures of the IDF, and where were they for day after day, you know, what we've seen is that this policy mowing the lawn is not going to bring you safety. This policy is not going to bring you security. This policy means that thousands of people will be murdered. And maybe it's time for a change in policy. I guess that's maybe the most we can hope for. I think that there are you know, different parts and different elements and different talking points will work to, for different segments. But g- generally, I think you're right. I mean, I think that the there, there is um, a sense that Netanyahu, Mr. Security, has failed. And this means that there might be a possibility to, to, to rethink what this means. One of our members, and I, I mentioned this in the beginning, but one of our members who was killed on October 7th was a guy named Chachar Tzemach, who was a testifier of ours and an activist of ours, uh, when he was a student in Ben Gurion University, and and he was from Kibbutz Berry, uh, and he went back to Kibbutz Berry, uh, and he was part of the sort of civilian security coordinating team. He was really a, a very sweet, very sweet guy, very humble, very very smart, and 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 ap- apparently from from the testimonies of of the people who were there just before he was killed and who managed to sort of bring this to light. Just before he was shot, he yelled at the Hamas member, from what we understand, who shot him, I'm not your enemy. I'm not your enemy. I was just talking about this to a friend who also knew Shachar, and, you know, we both didn't talk about, we didn't talk for a while, and, and, and we were just sort of, both of us sort of talking about Shachar, and we both, like, together brought up this one sentence from this piece like and he said did you hear what he said like i'm not your enemy it was like such a shachar moment of of like to reach out even in this crazy moment and you know of course he, he was his enemy in that moment he shot and killed him you know i think about shachar and, and i think about some of the ideas he had and, and and specifically a piece he wrote a few years back he wrote in 2019 or 2020, a piece that we helped him publish about how the the state is basically draining the security from the special security coordinators in the kibbutzim, talking about how those are going to settlements. And I think that there's a that there is a moment where people like Shacha or people you know who who, who think like who thought like Shacha, or will read sort of Shachar's ideas, will we'll maybe wake up to this concept that investing our security and our might in illegal outposts on various hills is not for the benefit of our security. And the fact that soldiers just a day before October 7th were sent to guard Hawara, right? Or soldiers were sent from 
the Gaza border into the West Bank could be a moment to people to wake up and say, this doesn't give us more security. So, so there is that potential. There is that, there is that potential. I, I think that it, that it really depends on sort of the political constellation on the one hand, but also look very much on, on who will be elected in, in the U S in November. Cause if, if, uh, if we're going to, see a, you know, God forbid, a Trump presidency, then, yeah, I, I don't see a lot uh, shifting on that corner. Maybe we'll move forward with the Trump peace plan, quote unquote. Uh, but, you know, that won't do anything but, uh, you know, prepare the the next wave of violence. So I think that there, there's also a very strong element of not only what Israelis will decide, but also what Americans will decide um, for our future. And of course, both Israelis and Americans will decide the future of Palestinians, but that's sort of, you know, the way things go. I want to thank you so much, Avner, for taking the time to talk to us, for the work that you do, for your generosity of spirit, and Mazel Tov on the birth of Adam. And uh, thanks. Thank you so much. Bevakasha. Boundary Issues is produced and edited by Paul Waldman. Our music is by Zeke Shabon. If you'd like to get in touch, you can email us at waldmanpodcast at gmail.com. And this is a listener-supported podcast. So if you'd like to support us, you can go to patreon.com slash boundaryissues. See you next time.